All right. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Daniel. I'm from the Google product security team in Zurich. Um, and my presentation title is actually a lie. I'm not going to talk about that. And my presenter doesn't work. There you go. Um, so originally, my plan was to talk about some of the best bugs we've received in our vulnerability rewards program over the last year or so, and talk about some of the numbers, how much money we pay out. But basically, you can find all that on our Twitter account, um, Google VRP, where we just uh, repost write-ups and all that. So I encourage you to just check that out. So what I want to do instead is um, talk about how you can kind of succeed to, uh, with the Google VRP as an entry-level um, reporter. I know it's 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 easy to see um, a big target like Google as this intimidating product. You have a big security team working on things like Gmail, but actually there are a lot of uh, kind of low-hanging fruits and ways you can find your niche within the program and uh, still succeed. So I want to share some of the strategies we've seen in our uh, top reporters. So when I say the Google VRP is basically the same as any other Google bug, uh, as any other bug bounty program. You send us reports, we look at them, we file uh, internal bug reports, and then hopefully eventually money shows up on your bank account. Google actually has multiple of these programs. Um, when I say the Google VRP, I mean um, kind of the catch-all program, but there are several uh, specialized sub-programs. For example, Android and Chrome have um, their own programs. Um, there's a special program for vulnerabilities in high-profile Play Store apps, and so on. So I want to talk about uh, the core program that basically covers everything. On the inside, it's basically just a bunch of engineers looking at every single report. Um, what's um, to note is that we actually have full-time security engineers uh, in Zurich and in California looking at every single report. So if you go to the form, you tell us about your bug description, um, you will not go to some outsourced support or level one support where you have to kind of escalate your way up, but you will end up uh, straight with security engineers. Um, we made this choice uh, both to make sure we don't miss out on any reports um, where subtleties of the bug get lost kind of in the process, and also to be able to help researchers grow if um, they maybe found something that's worth looking into, but they just need a little push in the right direction, and we can help by providing more context uh, um, on the specialties that uh, are in Google's infrastructure. And what we look at is basically everything you can associate with the Google brand. That includes some of our core products, uh, Gmail, YouTube, Drive, everything that's related to ads, um, all the mobile apps we have on there, newer platforms, maybe your smart fridge has a Google app nowadays, and we have some calendar integrations. All of this is basically in scope. The same for cloud pl uh, platform stuff, uh, Google Compute Engine, Kubernetes Engine, Cloud SQL, all these products. Um, if you find a vulnerability there, um, it's in scope for our program. And there are some subtleties. For example, Kubernetes is technically an open source project, but if you find a bug in there and that has implications on the threat model of Kubernetes engine, we might actually give you money for that. So it's um, if you find a bug in some high-profile open source program, it's worth checking if there's a cloud offering and just give us a heads up. Maybe we haven't seen the bug yet or we just decide to pay you anyway because you found a cool bug. The third one is uh, hardware. Google has a lot of hardware nowadays. We have Things like Google Home, where you might be able to find undocumented APIs that let you control the volume of uh, device of your victim, or you have uh, Pixelbook and other Chrome OS devices. Uh, we pay for things like bypassing secure boot on these devices, so there's a pretty broad spectrum. And the last one is acquisitions. Google likes to acquire a company. Um, I looked at Crunchbase earlier, and it lists 233 acquisitions. I think there's a fairly low estimate. There are probably thousands of companies over the years that got acquired. Um, so they have pretty much everything you can imagine, and they're all in, um, in scope of the VRP, with some caveats that I'll get into. So every product you can think of has bugs, and Google has lots of products. So the logical implication is there are lots and lots and lots of bugs to be found within Google. And that's true. but 
it varies wildly how easy it is uh, to find bugs in different parts of Google and how much effort you have to put in and what's the impact. If you're able to leak emails uh, of some uh, unsuspecting Gmail user, that's pretty bad and we'll happily fix that as fast as possible and give you up to 7.5k or so for that. On the other hand, if you have a cross-site script uh, thing bug and some acquisition, that is still a valid technical vulnerability, doesn't, but it doesn't come quite close to the impact on some of our other properties. So it's important to kind of pick your targets well and go for the maximum impact. Um, I want to share a few strategies that some of our top reporters use. Um, but start with actually the most common one, even though it might not be the most effective, which is to look at our acquisitions. It's basically the approach to go for quantity. Uh, our acquisitions are typically startups or smaller companies that are still in their aggressive growth phase, so they go for business impact and not necessarily for the most secure tech stack that is available. And that makes sense for a business perspective. But it means that in these companies you can often find pretty trivial bugs. You can have reflected cross-site scripting in a search bar, for example. And that's great for bug hunters because it's easy to find low-hanging fruits and kind of get this reward over and over again. But there are a couple of um, caveats if you decide to go um, look at our acquisitions. Uh, for one is there's a really high chance of duplicates. Uh, first of all, because as part of the acquisition process, but also after the acquisition is closed, we do several rounds of internal assessments on these companies, and we build up a pretty large backlog of things that um, the team has to look at. So if if your startup gets acquired by, company, uh, by Google at some point, you can expect to have hundreds of super, uh, Back, uh, back tickets assigned from our internal teams all coming into your queue. So you can imagine that shortly after the acquisition, the teams are often overloaded and need some time to prioritize everything and fix it. So because of that, there's a six months blackout period uh, for acquisitions, during which uh, we won't pay out for bug reports, probably because we either already know about the report or because it will be uncovered in the ongoing internal testing. But even after these six months, there are lots and lots of reporters who know the six months period and immediately start looking at bugs. So it sometimes happens that within a few days, we get the same bug reported by 20 different people. Your chance of being the first one are pretty small, and the chance of us not having found a reflected XSS somewhere is also pretty small. So you will often get um, kind of frustrating duplicate responses. And at the same time, the impact of acquisition bugs is arguably much lower, um, partially because the user base is just so much smaller than most of the other Google products. Um, think about what you can do with an XSS and Gmail versus in some acquisition that maybe has a, a few thousand users. But also because under the hood, um, these companies aren't as tightly integrated into the rest of the Google ecosystem. Um, Say you found a bug in a product running at www.google.com slash shoes. That would allow you, uh, so if you have code execution on this origin, you basically have access to the sensitive cookies and co can do anything that any application running on the same domain can do. Whereas if you're on ournewacquisition.com, this doesn't really uh, cover any other Google acquisitions, uh, any other Google products. And similarly on the infrastructure side, most Google Core products run on the same uh, infrastructure that's somewhat like Kubernetes, it's called Borg, um, where if you have code execution inside, there's a pretty high chance you can hit sensitive APIs. So if you have code execution in a go uh, core Google product, we will basically throw money at you because we'll freak out. Um, whereas if you have code execution in some random web application running on a cloud project, the impact is much, much lower. And because of that, we pay out um, significantly less money for these bugs. So if you have found an XSS in some ex acquisition, you will get uh, $100, which is nice. But at the same time, if you find an XSS on www.google.com, you will get 50 times more, $5,000. So if you're able to find bugs and acquisitions 50 times faster than the core Google products, it's worth going after them. But it might not um, always be the case. So if you decide to look at the core Google products, there are a few specialties that make these targets um, harder to get into than the typical application. Um, for one, because Google has pretty much invented the entire technology stack, from the first IP uh, packets hitting our load balancers all the way up to um, web frameworks, pretty much everything is running on in-house frameworks. And that can be intimidating and confusing initially because 
there just aren't any mature um, pen testing tools out there to deal with these frameworks and libraries. Similarly, there are no standard databases. Um, I don't think I've ever seen a SQL injection bug in uh, one of our core pro products, um, partially because these are running on specialized databases. Um, and the same continues in the network layer on libraries and so on. But that can actually be an advantage to you because on the other side, even the Google security team cannot rely on the amazing tools that are out there in the wild. So some of the weaknesses in our tools might not be um, as easy to scan for just because we have to build all the tools ourselves. And if, if you invest the time and understand how certain Google applications work, that can pay dividends really, really quickly. Um, internally, we have a really centralized engineering culture. So for example, whenever two services at Google communicate, they do so via protocol buffers. Um, it's an open source thing. Basically, you have indexed fields in a data structure with the definition format. And whenever you look at a Google product and it's doing some weird network communication, pretty much all you have to do is figure out where the protocol buffer is. And then you can start reverse engineering this and just start flipping fields. And then you can basically start writing a fuzzer or do your normal um, pen testing activity. And then once you figure out this, it's really, really easy to go from one product to the other because they're all built on the same libraries we use internally. So this will give you an advantage over pretty much everyone else who hasn't put in the time uh, to understand how the products work. Um, school has a bit of a not invented here syndrome. I guess that's pretty obvious. Um, meaning most of the tools are completely developed in-house, partially because there were no alternatives at the time we started building them. This is luckily not slowly changing. But it also reflects in the way we approach um, internal security assessments. So engineers, especially on the security side, are kind of skeptical on using uh, third-party off-the-shelf libraries. <laughs> say, um, say you want to do video encoding. The obvious choice for this is FFmpeg. And we haven't rewritten our own FFmpeg to do video encoding. Um, but what we'll do instead is put all of these kind of untrusted pieces of code in a sandbox layer. So uh, if you if you uh, if you find that there's uh, some bug in a an exposed library somewhere, um, in most of the cases this will actually be sandboxed, so it um, pays off to kind of check if this looks like a real environment. And it could be that you found a code a remote code execution, but you will still get a very low uh, reward just because it is sandboxed. So in some cases, if you believe something is outdated, it pays off to just send us a report saying, hey, I believe there's a vulnerable version of this library in use. Um, can you check? And if there is and there's, uh, there are known code execution bugs, we will just pay out immediately and you don't have to go through the steps of proving it. And that can save you a lot of time and frustration versus, um, in the end, realizing that something was sandboxed all the way. So as I said, it really pays off to uh, go deep into one uh, product or target. Um, basically, just pick one product or pick one attack class and really try to understand how Google is implementing this specific thing and then gradually ramp up complexity. Um, for example, just take a write-up of um, some bug in Google Groups and then look at, uh, try to reproduce the steps uh, that the person took, look at the requests that actually go over the wire, start messing with some fields, and that can really show you uh, really quickly how things work and uncover bugs. And like in any other uh, bounty program, just follow the rewards. Um, you will often initially get inconsistent or surprising uh, rewards. I already mentioned the case with sandboxing, where you might get a, a lower reward, but also on the opposite side. Maybe you found some file inclusion, and then all of a sudden we pay you for remote code execution because we internally know that there's some weird trick to get code execution from there. So it really, um, whenever you're surprised by one of the rewards, just ask us and we'll happily exp um, explain how we got there. And that can teach you a lot about how the infrastructure works internally. Um, on the other hand, if you're consistently not getting any rewards, uh, just pick a different target. There are lots and lots to choose from. <laughs> Uh, there's a great talk at uh, Chaos Communication Congress from last year. It's called Attacking Chrome IPC, but it, actually the most important takeaway there is uh, kind of this strategic learning approach on um, how to pick the next more complicated target and kind of grow from there. So I highly recommend to check that out. So 
The first way to specialize uh, within the Google programs is to just focus on one product. There are lists on Wikipedia, on the internet, of Google products. One source that's really, really valuable for um, the Google program specifically is certificate transparency. Um, Google champions TLS everywhere, and we're a big fan of certificate transparency. So every single uh, TLS service that we publish uh, will show up in transparency logs, and that can give you a heads up that we're launching maybe some new sandbox service somewhere or a new staging environment. But um, really the, the sweet spot, in my opinion, are not the brand new products because they get a lot of attention during the launch process and they're built on secure by default frameworks. Um, but instead, try to look at uh, some of the older products that look like they haven't received a lot of engineering attention in the past years. Say, Google Groups is a good example. The UI hasn't really changed in the, in the past 10 years or so, or the old calendar UI. It looked the same for a decade or so. So chances are high that there is no big engineering team behind this uh, UI that keeps track of the latest security trends and implements all the mitigation and so on. So you can often find uh, bugs in these products more easily just because they haven't adopted to more modern practices yet. But at the same time, the older products are often still exposed on sensitive properties like they're hosted on www.google.com slash product name. And that immediately multiplies the impact of uh, your bugs. If you have a cross-site scripting bug, you will, um, you will immediately be in uh, the most second most sensitive tier just because you're running on the same origin. And the older applications are more commonly uh, running on these origins, unfortunately. So once you understood one product fairly well and uh, know the business logic, you're probably already ahead of our internal security team. You've seen how many products there are um, and if you if you spend several weeks or so looking at one product, you probably know the security properties and assumptions underlying it much better than we do. So what you can then do is uh, look at how this product is integrates with all the other ones. Um, a good example there is in the ads space where uh, some of the ads projects um, allow you to link with Google Analytics. These are separate products that are maintained by different teams. So. The moment you can link projects and that gives you privileges on the other side in some way, or you can see data from another product in another one, that means there's some special authentication flow going on that is that relies on uh, security assumptions being correctly interpreted on both sides. And the older these integrations are, the more the other each side is developed, and probably we will have forgotten about one of the considerations somewhere. So these are really a treasure trove to look at. The other way to specialize is to go for a specific attack vector. Um, because our engineering practices and security teams are so centralized, um, chances are if we missed one security problem somewhere, we probably missed it in a lot of other places as well. Um, so that's the really great way to work uh, off write-ups. If you can see a if you look at a write-up and there's some combination of um, mistakes that have to be combined for this really impactful bug, it pays to just look at other products and where could these environments uh, take place, and chances are high that you will have find the same bug. Um, for example, we have this one guy called Dimitri, and pretty much all he does is he looks at Android applications and what kind of intents you can send to the application, and then tries to convince the application to leak sensitive data. Like, you ask Gmail to upload an attachment, and you say, hey, give me the internal message database that's in your application private folder. And many of these applications will happily respond um, with their internal data just because they incorrectly trust the parameters of the intent. That's a fairly straightforward pattern. Um, and Dimitri has managed to find dozens and dozens of these bugs. So nowadays, whenever we get a bug like this, we just say, ah, it's one Dimitri. And one Dimitri means we pay him uh, $1,300. So that's great. You want to be like Dimitri. Um, again, the sweet spot here are bugs that are hard to eradicate at scale. Um, so you can imagine that whenever we get a series of bugs or one really impactful bug, we do this internal variance analysis. And just Put yourself in a position of someone who has a search console in front of him and can search the entire Google source code base with a regex. If there's a regex that will show you all instances of the same bug, we will probably run this search and just fix all the bugs in one commit. So what you're looking for are bugs that are more um, kind of more abstract and more on the logic side of things. 
one good example here are privilege escalations within a product. So if you have uh, some product where you have editor access and read only or certain different roles of users that shouldn't access each other's data, um, we often get this, wrong, get this wrong, unfortunately. So in many cases, if you have read-only access, maybe there's some endpoint that lets you edit something just because we forgot uh, to put this check somewhere. And Google has lots of products like this. So if you um, know the, kind, uh, the kinds of interactions that take place and are in a position to understand how Google APIs work, uh, look like, I already mentioned it's all protocol buffers. Once you figure out where the protocol buffer goes over the wire and how it's formatted, you can just switch parameters and find cool bugs within a few minutes or hours. <laughs> so once you've found the bug, um, I want to share a few um, tips on how to package this nicely. Um, Jason had this uh, good presentation already in the morning, and I can basically agree with all he said, but um, specifically to, um, to the Google program I already mentioned, we have um, full-time security engineers in the first level triage already. So you don't uh, you don't have to phrase the vulnerability in a way that makes sense to the average uh, developer, but phrase it in a way that makes sense to a security engineer. And consider that we only take 10 to 30 seconds or so to make the initial priority assessment. We will look at everything, but if we get a two-page report where it's not immediately clear what the impact is, you'll probably get, end up in a lower priority bucket and it will take days or several weeks in the worst case before we can get back to you. So the template trick that Jason mentioned earlier in his uh, methodology talk actually works really well. If you can just scroll over the re um, report and have a bullet point impact, that is one sentence that explains what what is the actual impact that what happens when the bucket exploited, what kind of data is leaked, what action is taken, attack scenario, under which circumstances can this actually happen. Things like Alice and Bob, Alice shares this link with Bob, Bob clicks it, and so on. Reproduction steps, make it easy to reproduce the bug. This is the only place where you should um, present it in a way that makes sense to the developer, because the reproduction steps are ultimately passed as is to the development team in most cases, whereas the impact and remediation guidance is not as important for us, um, because that gets translated by our security team. Um, and of course, keep the discussion concise and technical. Don't try to social engineer your way into a reward. This will just make it slower, and ultimately we might decide that something that is actually a bug is not a bug if we feel like the arguments are not con um, conveyed in a technical way, right? So just keep it technical, and everything else will follow. Um, we have uh, the Bug Hunter University, which is, uh, which is basically a collection of tips on how to, uh, how to design uh, your reports, uh, things to look out for, presentations. Uh, so I can only recommend to check that out. One more thing, try to avoid complicated tooling setups. Um, probably all of you are fans of fancy automated tooling. Um, most of you seem to uh, seem to be using Burp, which is super awesome. Um, but at the end of the day, um, we all rely on the development teams on the product side to reproduce and fix the bug. So if you require knowledge of three different security tools, this will delay uh, the bug fix in the end because we have to convey the report in a way that the product team doesn't have to install Burp on their machines. So I want to close with some of the lesser known ways to get even more money from Google. Um, the first of which being uh, the abuse VRP. And that's actually our way of rewarding um, security issues that aren't technical vulnerabilities. Say, you can abuse some free cloud resources to mine Bitcoin on a thousand cloud instances without being detected by any of our counter abuse systems. Or there's a way of data sharing within some app where users might accidentally share more data than they're willing to just because there's a poor interaction between some steps. Or you can systematically bypass some review in, say, Google Maps. You can uh, take over listings on Maps. We've had great reports, actually, that involved sending postcards to fake mailboxes and then relying on some postal routing issues, things like that, that systematically bypass our, our review processes. We actually care about these and want to help the products um, fix their high-level business logic. Um, so we will reward these separately in the Google Abuse Vulnerability Reward Program. 
And the way this works is you just send us the usual report, and if it looks like something that our trust and safety teams might care about, we will just transparently route it their way. So if you found something that is super weird, but technically working as intended, maybe it's worth submitting it anyway, and we might uh, end up issuing a reward for that. Um, the second one, and personally my favorite one, is research grants, which is basically free money from Google, no strings attached. Um, the way this works is um, once you, uh, you've submitted several uh, high-quality reports to us, and uh, we repeatedly issued bounties to you, uh, you can apply for these research grants, where we basically ask you to please look at this new product. Um, maybe because there are some technology choices in there that we believe are m more risky, uh, or just because we don't have the time to look at the product ourselves as much as we would like to. So these are products where you are more likely to find bugs anyway. And we just give you money to do our job, basically. Um, you can just look at the product. If you don't find any bugs, that's perfectly fine. You will just keep the money. If you find bugs, you will still get extra money. So we pay for each uh, bug individually as on top of that. The only thing we ask for in these cases is that you kind of do a write-up of what, what you looked at, what kind of bugs, uh, your methodology, that we can get, get a better understanding of how much scrutiny the product actually received. Um, yeah. Highly re uh, recommend to check this out if you submitted a few successful reports. <laughs> and the last one, and uh, maybe a good way of getting into uh, fuzzing, is our patch rewards program. And this means we basically pay you for proactive security improvements to the open source world. Say you're implementing a new exploit mitigation, or you're adding a new exploit mitigation to some high profile uh, library that's prone to memory corruption. And that will ultimately make it more safe for the entire world to use this library. Or you're implementing a fast check for some complicated file format parser. Um, there's a list of, a pretty large list actually, of uh, libraries and frameworks that we care about. Uh, you can find it on uh, our VRP website. And as soon as you make these contributions, just tell us about them. We'll take a look and then issue rewards up to several thousand dollars uh, for them. And that's, so if you ever wanted to get started with, say, fuzzing, just pick an open source library uh, on this list that doesn't yet have good fuzzing coverage, write a fuzzer, work with the, uh, with the maintainers of the library, get the good feeling of having improved the open source world, and get some money uh, along the way. Similarly, um, we have Autofuzz patch rewards. Autofuzz is um, a fuzzing pipeline where we run fuzzers on open source libraries. And whenever our fuzzers detect a unique crash signature, we will file a bug in our public bug tracker. So you can just go to the Google issue tracker, take a look at which unique crashes there are, comment on one of them saying, hey, I want to fix that. Then you take a look at the crash, write a patch, work with the maintainers to get it accepted upstream. And if it stays upstream for a month and fixes actually fixes the crash, then again, we will give you money. So. That's a great way of uh, kind of getting into fuzzing, especially if you want to later on use the fuzzing knowledge to uh, find bugs. All right, um, that's all I got. I was under the impression that I have 30 minutes. Well, apparently I have 45, so it's a bit early. Um, but if you have any questions or comments, I'm happy to answer. Mm. Thanks for coming.